Today we have with us pediatric intensivist Dr. Javed Ismail with special interest in pediatric critical care nutrition discussing on nutrition in critically ill patients. Hello all. Welcome to the second part of the pediatric critical care nutrition series. In this video, we shall be discussing more of the practical aspects of critical care nutrition. I shall be answering these seven common questions that we have regarding the nutrition. First, we shall be discussing on the root of nutrition, whether to give enteral or parenteral. We all know that enteral is more physiological, easily accessible, associated with less complications and less cost involved, whereas parental nutrition is associated with higher risk of infection and needs to be monitored for hepatic and metabolic complications. Also, the cost involved is high, may not be available in certain centers. The famous Pepanic trial, which compared early parental nutrition versus late parental nutrition. Early was defined as starting parental nutrition within 24 hours of ICU admission, whereas late delaying starting parental nutrition till day 8 of ICU admission. When these two groups were compared, the clinical outcomes, namely newer infections, duration of ICU stay or hospital stay, and patients requiring more than 8 days of ICU admission were worse in early parental nutrition group. Notably, the caloric intake with enteral nutrition were equal in both groups. Similar outcomes were seen in a cohort of undernourished children from same group, where withholding parental nutrition for one week lowers the risk of new infection and shortens the duration of ICU stay by two days. Therefore, American Society of Parental and Enteral Nutrition recommends to start parental nutrition only when there is an anticipated nilpar oral of more than seven days and it needs to be started after a delay of about three to four days of ICU admission. Now let's move on to discuss timing of initiation of enteral nutrition, whether early or late, which is better. In this retrospective study, early was defined as provision of 25% goal calories enterally over the first 48 hours. And it was observed that providing early enteral nutrition had lower mortality. In the right side graph, we can see that the hospital charges per day was significantly low in early enteral nutrition group. Similar results from the secondary analysis of half pin trial where early was compared with the late, it was observed that early enteral nutrition had better clinical outcome. Are there any contraindications for enteral feeding? The absolute contraindications are intestinal failure like intestinal perforation or ischemia or obstruction or ongoing gastrointestinal bleeding. Absence of bowel sounds is not a contraindication to initiate enteral feeding. Many of our patients in the ICU will be on inotropic support. In a small study in which all the patients were on vasoactive support, those who were fed were compared with non-fed and it was observed that clinical outcomes in terms of mortality was lesser in the fed group, though the GI outcomes were similar. Now let's move on to discuss what are the barriers in starting enteral nutrition. The common barrier is a procedure or surgical visits followed by other reasons like no dietitian cover on the holidays, no enough time for education, training regarding nutrition, other aspects of care taking priority over nutrition, and often delay in obtaining small bubble access. Around 60% of these reasons are avoidable in nature. Feed intolerance is a common issue in patients who are receiving enteral nutrition. The common symptoms observed are diarrhea, abdominal distension, GI bleeding, abdominal discomfort, large gastric residual volumes, or constipation. Various studies have tried to define feed intolerance. In this systematic review, feed intolerance was defined as presence of one of these, namely discontinuation, discontinuation of enteral feeds due to GI symptoms, presence of large gastric residual volumes or GI symptoms, or inability to achieve target enteral intake. The median prevalence in the systematic review was up to 20%. If a patient has symptoms of feed intolerance, the common strategy is to withhold feeds for 2-4 to four hours, monitor the, monitor the symptoms, try to identify the etiology, and treat symptomatically. Once the symptoms start resolving, restart half feeds and gradually hike and continue monitoring. The common symptomatic management involves elevation of head end of bed, assess the enteral tube position, correct electrolyte imbalances like hypokalemia, check if there are ongoing medications that decrease the gut motility and check if these can be discontinued and evaluate need for starting new medications like anti-epileptics, pro proton pump inhibitors or prokinetic agents. Now let's move on to discuss which is better, either to start gastric feeding or post-pyloric feeding. Gastric feeding is more physiological, simpler, and can be started easily. 
because expertise required for insertion of NG tube is very less. The limitations of gastric feeding are risk of aspiration, gastroparesis resulting in gastric residual volumes. Whereas in post-pyloric feeding, the risk of aspiration is less and the gastric residual volume is lesser. The limitations of post-pyloric feeding is that the insertion itself may delay initiation of feeds. And, and for feeding post-pyloric, we need to give continuous feeds, requires feeding pumps which may not be available in low resource settings. In a systematic review which compared gastric versus post-pyloric feeding, it was observed that there was reduction in incidence of ventilator-associated pneumonia with post-pyloric feeding. However, the time required to start post-pyloric feeding was more prolonged compared to gastric group. In both groups, other clinical outcomes like mortality, length of ventilation or length of ICU stay was similar. Let's now discuss whether to give as continuous feeds or intermittent feeds. Continuous feeds are defined by providing enteral feeding through pump over 24 hours or a longer duration like 20 hours or 18 hours duration. The advantages of continuous feeds is that it is less labor intensive and has better glycemic control and gastric residual volumes are much lesser. In intermittent or bolus feeds, feeds are provided over a short duration of 20 to 60 minutes. It has been observed that bolus feeds are more physiological it enhances muscle protein synthesis and results in reduction in incidence of diarrhea. And also, it allows the patient to be rehabilitated, especially in ambulatory patients. In a small prospective study, the bolus gastric feeding was associated with higher energy and protein take and faster time to reach goal volumes. And there were no aspiration events reported in either group. Now let's discuss what to feed. Whatever be the type of feed, the proportion of carbohydrates, proteins, or fats should be kept constant. In young infant less than six months, express breast milk is the best. Or if it is not available, infant formula feeds, which has calorie content of 0.7 kilocalories per ml, can be used. In children more than six months, locally prepared culturally acceptable feeds like enriched milk, sujiki, or kisiri feeds can be used. These feeds are polymeric, which contain a calorie density of 1 kilocalorie per ml and these are protein-rich feeds. In malabsorptive states, semi-elemental or elemental diets are indicated. In patients with severe acute malnutrition, start with F75 diet for initial two days and then gradually transition to F100 diets. There are no recommendations for a specific type of diet in obese children, whereas in obese adults, hypocaloric diet with adequate protein is, be is being recommended. In patients with acute liver failure, special hepatic feeds, which contain proteins which are low in aromatic amino acids and high in branch amino acids are available. These feeds also contain high calorie density and low sodium and also dietary fiber to augment gut motility. In patients with nephrotic syndrome, protein intake of at least 1.5 gram per kg should be ensured. Salt restriction is essential to control edema and hypertension. In children with acute renal failure, which per se is a catabolic state, the energy intake should fit in the fluid restriction for the patient. Also, those on dialysis require higher protein intake, even up to 2 gram per kg per day. A simple protocol like this, which is designed for a specific ICU, is found to be helpful. In a systematic review, enteral nutrition protocols were found to be associated with improved timeliness of feed initiation and achievement of goal caloric intake. Also, it was associated with reduction in GI and other infective complications. How do we monitor these patients for nutritional adequacy while they are in the ICU? The commonly used methods to monitor nutritional adequacy are by serially monitoring anthropometric parameters, which may include length of the patient, weight, mid upper arm circumference. However, each of the anthropometric parameters may not be reliable in ICU patients. Also, serum protein levels like serum pre-albumin transferrin can be used to monitor nitrogen balance. Newer modalities like monitoring muscle thickness or body composition are coming up in a big way in monitoring these children in the ICU. In a small study of critically ill children, serial muscle thickness was measured using ultrasound at the baseline and six days apart. It was observed that there was a loss of muscle thickness of up to 10% in up to 50% of these children. Presence of edema or contractures can limit their validation in these patients. 
other newer modality like measurement of body composition using various methods like DEXA scan, bioelectrical impedance, or CT or MRI imaging is coming up in a big way. With these studies, it has been observed that during convalescence, the rate of muscle synthesis can be as slow as just one person per day. And the quality of muscle that is generated can be poor, adipose tissue repletes rapidly, and it may take months to restore the lean muscle mass that was lost. ICU nutrition is a teamwork with intensivists, nurses, dietitians, physiotherapists, and pharmacists all need to collaborate to achieve a target caloric intake to achieve better outcomes. So in summary, we, in the first lecture, we saw that Nilpar oral is harmful, metabolic response to stress is a dynamic process, and we also saw methods to estimate resting energy expenditure and various challenges in the ICU. In this lecture, we saw that enteral nutrition is the key. We should start early, we should individualize for the patient, minimize interruption, anticipate, monitor, and treat complications, and go by a protocolized team approach. If you like these videos, Please like and subscribe us and follow us for more updates.